Hello everyone. Welcome to the Design Wide Input Voltage DC DC Converter Made Easy webinar. My name is Anthony Huyen. I'm a principal application engineer at Maxim Integrated. Today, I would like to share with you some basic knowledge about switching DC DC power supply design and show you how easy it is to design a switching DC DC power supply using Maxim's eSIM design tool. I'll start with an introduction to converter topologies. Then I'll focus on a buck converter, discussing design requirements, component calculations and selections, design trade-offs, system surges and transient consideration. I'll then show you a simple way to design a synchronous buck DC-DC converter using eSIM tool. I will also highlight the adjustable wide bandwidth internal compensation, an important and very beneficial feature that you should know about. Lastly, I'll discuss the progression of DC-DC converter higher integration, where power models can offer you ease of use, faster time to market power solution. What is the difference between a linear regulator and a switching regulator? The linear regulator operates as a variable resistor connected between the input power source to the output load. The resistor is automatically adjusted by the control loops to create a voltage drop between V in and V out, maintaining V out at the desired voltage regardless of the load current. Linear regulator is very lossy, especially when the difference between V in and V out is large. The switching regulator, on the other hand, switches the input source, chopping it at a certain duty cycle, then uses an LC filter to smooth out the output voltage. Switching regulator is inherently very efficient because there is no large voltage drop in the high current path. This is a switching buck regulator. The pulse width modulator or PWM switches on and off V in at the duty cycle D. When the switch is on, V in appears at the input of the LC filter and the current flows from V in to V out. Then the switch is off, the diode conduct current flows through the rectifying diodes and the LC output filter. Assuming ideal circuit elements, this switching system is lossless and efficiency can be 100%. Here are the three basic switching DC-DC converter topologies. By rearranging the switching elements and the LC filter, we can get either a buck or step down converter where V out is lower than V in. So for the buck converter, V out is V in time the duty cycle. The pictures in the middle is the boost converter where V out is greater than V in. The buck boost converter is the bottom can have the output voltage either higher or lower than the input voltage. The buck boost also the output can be inverted being negative relatively to the input voltage. Why synchronous rectification? Let's take a closer look at a buck converter. The schematic on the left is a non-synchronous buck converter where a diode is used to conduct the inductor current during the off time. As you can see in this example, the diode has a voltage drop of 0.5 volt when conducting 2.5 amp through it, resulting in a 1 watt power dissipation in this diode. And most of you probably already know, but this is the formula to calculate the power dissipation in this diode. The power dissipation is the voltage drop across the diode VD here, uh, 0.5 volt, multiplied by the output currents of 2.5 amp and 1 minus V out over V in is the duty cycle during the off time. So this is 1 minus the duty cycle. And that 
come out to be about 1 watt. The circuit on the right replaces the diode with a synchronous FET. This FET has about 80 milliohms of uh, on resistance. Ignoring other losses, the conduction loss of this FET is only 0.4 watts, a 60% reduction in power losses comparing to the non-synchronous solution on the left. Again, this is the formula to calculate the conduction losses of, of the FET, which is the R on time the square of the output current, and multiply again by the off time duty cycle 1 minus D, uh, or 1 minus V out over V in here. So the total power dissipation for the synchronous FET is only 400 milliwatts. So this is a lot lower than the non-synchronous solution. So, what does it mean when synchronous rectification dissipates less power? It really means the system runs cooler. In this example, the synchronous solution on the right runs 30 degrees C cooler. Every 10 degrees C cooler in operating temperature doubles the life expectancy of the solution. So, in this example, the synchronous solution is expected to last eight times longer than the non-synchronous solution on the left. So, when you are designing high reliable system, pay close attention to the operating temperature of the solution. High efficiency, non-synchronous rectification, switching DC-DC converter would be a good choice. Another characteristic of synchronous rectification is the ability to run the converter in continuous conduction mode for any load current. These graphs show the inductor current waveforms and the output current. For this buck converter, the output current is the average of the inductor current. The graph on the left shows the currents for a non-synchronous rectification buck converter. Since the diode only conducts current in one direction, the inductor current stops at zero when the output current decreases below one half of the inductor peak-to-peak -peak ripple current. In this mode, the inductor current is not continuous, hence it's called discontinuous conduction mode, or DCM. The graph on the right shows the currents for a synchronous rectification buck converter. The power FET can conduct current in either direction when it's turned on, allowing the inductor current to decrease below zero, as you can see here, drop below zero, keeping the inductor current peak-to-peak -peak ripple current constant. In this mode, the inductor current flows continuously, so it is called continuous conduction mode, or CCM. While non-synchronous rectification buck converter can only run in DCM mode when the load current is light, the synchronous rectification buck converter has option to choose between DCM and CCM modes. The schematic on the top right shows a synchronous rectification buck converter schematic. Turning on and off the synchronous switch S2, this switch right here, at the appropriate time allows different modes of operation. The top sets of waveforms illustrate continuous conduction mode where S2 is turned on for the rest of the switching cycle after S1 turns off. So S1 turns on, and once it turns off, S2 is turned on. So during this time, S2 is turned on throughout this off-time period, allow the inductor current to decrease beyond zero. Uh, and in this region here, the inductor current drop to a negative values, which mean that it flow from the right to the left. CCM mode has high bandwidth, responds faster to a load step transition condition at any loading condition. The sets of waveforms in the middle illustrate discontinuous conduction mode. The switch S2 is turned off when the inductor current decreases to zero. So right here, S2 is turned off once the inductor current reaches zero not allowing it to conduct any further. So in this case, the circuits behave very similar to a non-synchronous solution. The difference is the FETs dissipate a lot less power than the, than the diodes. DCM mode is slightly more efficient than CCM mode since there is no inductor current flowing while both S1 and S2 are off. 
saving the power losses during this time. However, DCM mode doesn't respond to load step transition condition as well as the CCM mode. The set of waveforms in the bottom illustrate another mode of operation, pulse frequency modulation or PFM. In this mode, S1 and S2 switchings are periodically skipped for many cycles, resulting in a much lower switching frequency. You see here, we switch it on once, skipping many cycles, and then switch it on again. PFM mode is more efficient at lie load condition because switching losses associated with S1 and S2 are reduced. Both the DCM and CCM modes are fixed switching frequency mode or PWM mode, while PFM mode switching frequency varies with load. The lighter the load, the slower the switching frequency. These two plots compare the efficient improvement of PFM mode over PWM mode at lie load condition. For load current at 400 milliamps and above, both PFM and PWM modes work exactly the same way. As for output load decreases below 400 milliamps, PFM mode starts skipping the switching of S1 and S2 to save power. Let's look at the 24 volt curve right here, the red curve. For PWM mode, the efficiency at 400 milliamps is 88%, and quickly dropping down to only 67% at 100 milliamps. On the other hand, the PFM mode had the same efficiency at 88% at 400 milliamps. However, the efficiency improve and, and, and remain quite high even at 100 milliamps, where it's still at 85%. Now let's go through some practical design consideration and calculations. Here's a block diagram of a typical synchronous buck regulator power stage. On the left, we have the input source VN with an input filter ring capacitor, CN. The power switches S1 and S2. The output filter, inductor L, and output filter, C out. And here we have the output. The output current and the inductor current. Noted in the steady state condition, the current going through the capacitor here average out to be zero. So the average inductor current is the same as the output current. Typical design considerations. There are many things to be considered when designing a converters. First, let's take a look at a few design requirements. You know your input voltage range. You, you know your output voltage and current. Also, there may be a size, cost, or efficiency requirement as well that need to be considered. Now, beyond that, there are other design considerations that you need to decide. Switching frequency is important since it largely determines the physical size of the converter total solution. Higher switching frequency means smaller solution size but lower efficiency. Some system also has restriction on certain switching frequencies so not to interfere with other sensitive circuits. Inductive ripple current determines how much inductance is needed. Large inductance can provide lower inductive ripple current, thus lower output voltage ripple. But it's also slower when responding to a transient condition such as low step transient. Large inductance can also mean larger inductor and possibly more expensive. Output voltage ripple requirements dictate how much filtering is needed once the switching frequency has been chosen. Maximum device junction temperature is also very important for system reliability. As I mentioned before, lower junction temperature means higher mean time between failure or 
MTBF figure. Device operates at lower junction temperature, will last much longer than similar device operates at higher junction temperature. Loop bandwidth and stability is very important. The control loop must be compensated to assure st stable and proper operation. Higher loop bandwidth responds better to transient conditions such as low step transients. Here are some waveforms and equations for calculating the output filter inductor. The red trace is the switch node voltage LX shown to the left of the inductor in the schematic. When S1 is on, LX equal to Vn, current flowing from the input through the inductor to the output. During this on time, the inductor current increases at a rate proportional to Vn, Vout, and L. When S1 is off, S2 turns on, clamping LX to ground. The inductor current flows through S2 to the output. During this off time, the inductor current decreases as a rate proportional to V out and L. IAC, this part right here, is the peak to peak inductor current, also known as the inductor ripple current. Once we've chosen IAC, we can calculate the inductance values given the switching frequency and the input output voltage values. So, how do we choose the right values for inductor ripple current? Choosing a low inductor ripple current value dictates a higher inductance which gives lower output ripple, lower AC losses, and lower minimum load when the current goes from CCM into DCM mode at the expense of larger size inductor and slower transient response. Choosing a high inductor ripple current values dictates a lower inductance which gives faster transient response and could mean lower cost inductor. The disadvantage is higher output voltage ripple at a given output filter capacitor. A practical inductor ripple current values is between 10 to 30 percent of the maximum load current. Here are some equations to assist you with calculations involving inductor ripple current. First, calculate the inductor current ripple, which is a function of the output voltage, V out to duty cycle D, the switching frequency Fs, and the inductance value L. Worst case, inductor current ripple occurs at highest input voltage where the duty cycle is minimal. The second equation determines the DCM-CCM boundary condition. The circuit operates in CCM mode when the load current I out is equal to or greater than one half of the inductor current ripple. Of course, when designing a synchronous rectification switching buck converter using CCM mode, then this equation is not applicable. The fourth equation is quite important. It calculates the RMS current that flows through the inductor. This RMS current square times the inductor DCR is the DCR power loss in the inductor, which is the dominant power losses inside of the inductor. This equation is valid for all output current values in CCM operation. When selecting an inductor, make sure that you choose one with the IRMS rating higher than these calculated values. The output capacitor and its ESR affect loop bandwidth and stability, output voltage ripple, and load transient response. Select large enough output capacitance with low ESR to meet the desired output voltage ripple while balance it against solution cost. Large capacitance, low ESR also helps with load transient response given that the loop bandwidth is optimized and is stable. Capacitor value D rate with bias voltage. So when selecting the output capacitor, choose a capacitor values high enough to compensate for this D rating. 
Here are some equations to help you select the appropriate output capacitance to meet the desired output voltage ripple. There are two parts to the output voltage ripple calculations. One part is the result of the inductor current ripple and the capacitor ESR. So the output voltage ripple is determined by multiplying the IAC of the inductor ripple current to the ESR values of the output capacitor. This equation is good when you are working with uh, high ESR capacitance, such as the electrolytic capacitors. The other equation is a function of the inductive ripple current, the switching frequency, and the capacitance values. So for a ceramic capacitor, which uh, the modern DC-DC converter would use, this is a more important equation here for you to use. Depending on the type of capacitor used, one part will likely dominate over the other. Here are a couple of equations to determine the input capacitor. Input capacitor must be chosen to meet or exceed the RMS current requirement and to reduce the input voltage ripple. If there's no specific requirements on input voltage ripple, choose a value between 1% to 5% of the input voltage. Lower input voltage ripple will lower the EMI noise coupling back to the input power source. Common industry nominal rails are 5 volt, 12 volt, 24 volt, 36 volt, 48 volt, and so on. It depends on the market and the applications. Also, many systems are susceptible to tensions and surges, lightning strike, uh, cable ringing. All these requirements put a, a stringent need for system designer who need to consider all of these transients. So chosen a wide input buck regulator solve many of these surge transitions and wide uh, range problems. This example shows a factory power distribution. The building is divided into three different zones. Zone C, which is the factory main input that has the primary surge protection and must withstand and suppress severe interference coupling. Your lightning strike need to be protected. Zone B is a dedicated power distribution within the building. It has secondary surge protection and moderate industrial power interference coupling covered by the IAC 61000-6-2 standard. Zone A is a local power distribution. It is protected and has low interference couplings. Generally, this zone A is being powered by very well regulated power supplied. The industry PLCs are generally designed for zone B and zone A. When lightning strikes, zone B equipment can see as much as 500 volt across its input for tens of microseconds. Without proper protection, the equipment will get damaged from this high voltage surge. Here's a block diagram of an industrial PLC system. On the front, we have the power supply modules, followed by the CPU card, and then the I.O. modules and uh, other uh, control modules. Again, when lightning strike, there will be as much as 500 volts for tens of microseconds appear across the output of these power supply modules. In case of uh, few buses, which has long cable, the voltage here on this few bus can ring and double its input voltage. So in this system, you can also see as much as 6 the volt at the output of the few buses. So to protect against the finer volt transitions and inductance ringing, a TVS is used here, clamping right across the output of the power modules. When selecting a TVS, there are two very important parameters to consider. First, let's take a look at the this 24 volt system. This 24 volt system actually has a, a minus 15% plus 20% tolerance, as well as 5% AC ripple on top of it. So if you look at the worst case condition, this 24 volts 
systems actually can be as low as 19.2 volt and can be as high as 30 volt DC. Now, when choosing a TVS, there's two parameters that uh, you need to look at. The first parameter is the standoff voltage, or VR, listed down here. This is the voltage below which the TVS behaves like an open circuit. Choosing VR to be higher than the worst case, highest system DC voltage level, so that during DC operation, the TVS does not dissipate any power. So in this 24 volt system example, the DC voltage can be as high as 30 volt. That's why people are choosing the SMAJ33A, which has the VR standoff voltage of 33 volt, which is above 30 volts. The second parameter is the clamp voltage VC, shown here. This is the voltage where the TVS is trying to hold the voltage to as much as it can while dissipate a lot of energy through its body clamping this voltage right here. And when it does that, it can guarantee that it clamps the voltage up to 53.3 volts. So a DC-DC converter connected to this system must be able to withstand at least 53.3 volt. So in this case, a 60 volt rated DC-DC converter solution would be a good choice. For zone A application where the 24 volt can be very well regulated, lower VR and VC TVS can be used as listed down here. This SMAJ26A has a standoff voltage of 26 volt. And when it clamp, it can clamp the voltage to up to 42.1 volt. Now let's take a look at a design example. I've discussed design considerations. I've shown you various design equations. Now you can start your wide input DC-DC converter design using that information. Or perhaps it's a lot easier if we just go to the Maxim's eSIM design tool. We will use the Max 17503, which is a very popular part within our Himalaya wide input DC DC converter family, as an example. Okay, so here's an example of designing. Uh, using eSIM 2.0 with Max 17503. We want to have this system to work with a 24 volt nominal. And as I mentioned before, the voltage can be up to 30 volts. In this case, I choose 32. The input can start as low as 8 volts. 5 volt output at 2 amps. I've chosen the end of voltage lockout, rising edge of 5.5 volts. So the, technically, the converter can start to run at 5.5 volt input and run all the way up to 32 volt. And on top of that, because this part was rated for 60 volt, any transient voltage to 60 volt will not damage the system. I've chosen the input capacitor voltage ripple to be 1.5% or 350 millivolt on top of the input. The output voltage deviation of 3% uh, when we have a 50% load step going from 1 amp to 2 amps and back, or about 150 millivolts. The ambient is also important here, 85 degrees C. This is the worst case ambient for my system. Uh, with this information, I can simulate and see what is my worst case IC uh, die temperature during the worst case uh, ambient temperature. So with this information here, this is my design requirements. I take the information and now I go into eSIM tool. So within a few minutes, I enter all that information into eSIM tool. Over here is the design trade-offs. There are three different buttons. Uh, you can either choose a small solution size. When you click on that, it would give you the highest switching frequency solution. If we want high efficiency, then it would pick the lowest switching frequency that this converter can handle, which is 100 kilohertz. I pick the balance of efficiency and size, and that this, the tool would pick a switching frequency of 300 kilohertz, which is the, a very good balance for both. You can also enter directly a switching frequency here between 1 
to 2 megahertz for this device. Once I've entered all of the requirements and my choice of design trade-off, click the Create the Design button. The tool would design for me a complete circuit. I'm not shown here, but the, the building material is also included in this schematic, so you can actually extract the building material route directly uh, with all of the uh, real component part numbers uh, in the building material list. So from this schematic here, I do have a flexibility of changing components values. For example, the tour calculate an 18 micro Henry for this design. I happen to have a 15 micro Henry in stock and I want to use that. So click onto this device and I can actually select another part numbers, uh, which are also in the, um, in the selection uh, table inside of the tool. So I've changed that to 15 micro Henry inductors. I have a, also went in and changed some of these capacitor to what I desire to have, which are part that I have in stock. When we've changed the component values, make sure to lock it and recalculate. Once you lock it, the device turns into, there's a green colors right here, indicating that the device is locked. Locking uh, allow the tool to know that this is the desired values that I want to lock it to, and the tool doesn't try to revert it back to its uh, what it what it think is the best value for it. The yellow color here indicating that there's some recalculation is needed. Once I hit the recalculation button, the yellow color will disappear, and the tool will attempt to optimize the rest of the circuit based on the new value that I have just chosen. Once I've had my circuit designed, I now can run some simulation to see how my circuit works. Here's are some simulation result. At 85 degrees C ambient and 24 volt input, my efficiency shown peak at about 91% at 1 amp output and drop to about 89% at 2 amps. Here's the power losses. It shows with the load current. And more, most importantly is the junction temperature of my device at the worst case condition, maximum load, and maximum ambient temperature of 120 degrees C. So this is a very reasonable design. My junction uh, temperature isn't too hot. I've also run the simulation at 25 degrees C and uh, listed all the results in the tables down here. Notice that the efficiency at 25 degrees is higher than 85. The tool will take into consideration the self-heating effect of the power MOSFET. When the power MOSFET is heating up, the RDS on increases and so when the temperature is cooler, you actually have less losses in the MOSFET on resistance and thirst having a little bit better efficiency at uh, lower ambient temperature. I've also run the body plot and load tension response. It's shown here. The result shows that I've, got, I've gotten a solid design with good crossover frequency at 30 kilohertz and a healthy phase margin of 65 degree. The plot on the right is the 1M to 2M low step transient response. The red trace is the current going from 1M to 2M. The purple trace is the output uh, voltage ripple showing a 218 millivolt peak to peak. By the way, we compare that to the measure value on the real board of 220 millivolts, so we do have very good correlation between the, the measure and the similar values here. So, at this point, I've completed my design with full schematic, building materials, and simulations information. All that is done within 15 minutes. And you can do the same thing. So how is my simulation stacks up against the actual board? Here's are some test results on an actual board built with 
the exact same inductor and same capacitors that I've uh, chosen in the EECM environments. Efficiency is measured at 92% compared to the simulated values of 90.5%, which is about 1.5% up. That is actually pretty good. The IC junction temperatures is measured uh, at 56 degrees C, while the simulation predicts a 54 degrees C, which is off by 2 degrees. So we have a very good correlation between simulation and actual board. Now in this example, we'll show you uh, the flexibility of the tool where I have chosen previously a balanced design with efficiency and size. So the switch in frequency was chosen at 300 kilohertz, which is the solution on the left. Now on the right, I went in and also create a design. In this case, I actually choose the small size possible. So I choose one megahertz design. And in this case, the result is I have a board that have an area of 200 millimeter square, which is roughly half the size of the 300 kilohertz design. The efficiency is about 80%, 80, 80%, which is 8% less than the previous design. The temperature is also 10 degrees C, a little bit hotter than the other design. So I am showing you the flexibility of the tool where you can actually choose either efficiency or size or balance of both. And depend on what you need is, the tool will allow you to help you to design the right circuits for you. Internal compensations. So what, what is internal compensation? The, the control circuitry for a power supply require a control loops that need to be compensated to be stable and to be optimized for highest bandwidth possible. Usually compensations uh, require four to five external RC components and internal compensa compensations obviously save these components externally by putting them inside of the IC. The fixed internal compensation method does have some drawback once you fix the internal compensations for a certain circuit operating condition, such as switching frequency, output voltage, and output capacitor. If you deviate from these values, then the control loop will not be optimized and could even go unstable. Now, maximum internal compensation overcomes all of these limitations. This is a maximum adjustable Y bandwidth internal compensation. This is a very important and very beneficial features that you should know about. This internal compensation scheme allows the compensation circuit to be adjusted so that the bandwidth remain optimum and the circuit will operate the best possible at any given output voltage, any switching frequency, and output capacitance. So here, let's go back to take a look at the, the design that we had before. Now, what happened if we change the output capacitor C out? What happened to the bandwidth? So in this example, I had a 2x of this 22 microfarad capacitor before. Now I want to make it five times larger by using 10 of those capacitors. And that the reason is, if I want to reduce the output voltage ripple, that this is what I would uh, like to do, adding more capacitance. So what I'm going to do here is, uh, first, I run the stability, the body plot, and also the low step response with the original design values of 2x of this output capacitor. I would then change the capacitor to 10x, which is shown here in this schematic. And uh, without hitting the recalculation buttons here, I run the body plot, the low step response, and output ripple. A simulation to show you know, the effect of changing the output capacitor to the loop bandwidth and also the low step response. I would then recalculate, which means that I readjusted the loop to optimize the bandwidth of this system. And then I run the same simulation 
and we'll show you the difference in the result on the next slide. So here it is. On the left side is the original design with two times of the 22 microfarad capacitor on the output. In this uh, original design, my ripple voltage was 8.5 millivolt peak to peak. The crossover frequency was 30 kilohertz and 66 degree phase margin. And you can see the low step response, it's uh, very well behaved. And the peak to peak ripple is 218 millivolts. Now, in the middle here, I've changed the capacitors to five times as much, which is 10x, uh, without adjusting the loop, mimicking a fixed internal compensation scheme which is not what our circuit is, but this is just to uh, mimicking it. Now here, of course, when I change the output capacitor, the steady state output voltage ripple has reduced roughly five times. You can, you can see the ripple voltage, this is all the same scales here on the, on the y's axis. So the ripple voltage is a lot lower than what's on the left, which is a good thing. And this is what I intended to do for my design to lower the ripple. Uh, output voltage ripple. However, when I do that without optimizing or adjusting the compensation, so in cases where you have in fixed internal compensation, this is what is going to happen. The crossover frequency now have already been reduced from 30 kilohertz to 7 kilohertz. And my phase margin has dropped to below 60 degree. And as you can see that the low step response is now a little bit lower, but it could be a lot better. On the right, this is when I have adjusted using the MAX17503 adjustable high bandwidth compensation. Uh, with that, now you can see that, of course, the ripple output is the same, steady state ripple is the same, but the crossover frequency have come back to 31 kilohertz. And the phase margin is also above 60 degree. And my peak-to-peak -peak load transition response is now 122 millivolt, a lot lower than what you've seen here on the left. So with the maximum adjustable high bandwidth internal compensation, I've taken full advantage of these features. And you can see that the performance for this solution which is optimized is a lot better than what I have here in the middle. I just want to show you a slice, the lineup of our Himalaya high voltage buck regulators. We cover operation anywhere from 4.5 volt all the way up to 60 volts. And for load current anywhere from 25 milliamps to 5 amp with internal power MOSFET. And we do provide controller that provide solution for up to 50 amp. All right, let's talk about power modules. This is the uh, progressions of integration of power solution. This is a, an actual design of a synchronous buck controller. So this is the controller. Uh, the power MOSFETs are external. The inductors is also external and with, with many other components, compensation and others. Okay, down here, the schematic representing that. Going from a controller solution to a converter solution, we have integrated many things. We have integrated the power MOSFETs go inside of these converters. Compensations also go inside of converter. Current sensing also go inside of converter. So going from a controller to a converter solution, we have uh, reduced significantly the number of components as well as the total solution areas we have reduced about uh, to about half of the solution size. From a converted solution, going to modules. In this step, we integrated also the power inductors as well as many other external circuitry to make a module. These modules here has an input capacitor, output capacitor, and 
perhaps a couple of resistors to set the output voltage, and that would be your entire power solution. So models offer you ease of, ease of use, faster time to market. This is an example of a 60 volt, uh, 1.7 amp to 3.5 amp power module family in the one size package shown down here. One thing that I really want to point out about power modules is ease of use and ease of design. This is the, uh, this is the layout example of this, the, of these modules. As you can see, all the peripheral pins are out here, make it very easy to connect a couple of resistors here to set the output voltage. This is the soft start capacitors. And that's it. You only need the input capacitor and output capacitor, and that set up the whole power solution. The entire circuit can be laid out in a single layers with the bottom here for beefing up the power uh, conducting path. So modules really help in terms of uh, saving you the design resources, the design time, get you fast into the market. Here is the lineup of our modules, uh, Himalaya Power Modules family. All right, so in summary, I have described to you how a basic voltage regulator works. I went through some of the key design considerations. We look at a design example with simulation and compare the result with the hardware. I also highlight one very important features with Maxim Himalaya smart internal compensation. Provide you optimum bandwidth for any output voltage, any switching frequency, and any output capacitance. Again, power modules, small size, ease of use, faster time to market. With that, happy designing, and thank you very much for your attention.